All right. If you have your Bibles uh, and you would like to follow along, we'll be in Mark chapter 16 today. We're going to talk about the resurrection. Um, we're going to talk about the details that the Gospel of Mark shares about the resurrection. So, if you've read the New Testament, if you've followed along with uh, various passages, you'll notice that some details will be included in some of the accounts that aren't included in others. That's not a huge deal. Uh, I chose Mark for kind of a specific reason. I'll get to that in just a moment. Our big idea is that the written accounts of the resurrection of Christ are trustworthy with many convincing details. That the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a convincing eyewitness account written down for us in these uh, four Gospels. And then uh, testified to later, of course, in um, the rest of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul testifies in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, quite extensively about it and other passages like that. Uh, but the Gospels are where we encounter the, the straight narrative of the resurrection as it was uh, being laid out, as it was unfolding among the eyewitnesses of the time. Uh, Mark is uh, unique, just like the Luke is unique, in that neither of them were there. Now, they were not eyewitnesses, but they relied on eyewitness accounts. Uh, it's very likely that Mark relied, for example, on the Apostle Peter, who was there. Um, and some other stuff is going on as well. But we're going to talk about some of these convincing details as we go through Mark. And we'll be in Mark chapter 16. And we will read uh, Mark chapter 16, 1 through 8 uh, this morning. We'll start by reading verses 1 through 3. We'll get there in a second. If you're following along in the sermon notes that are in your bulletin, uh, their first main point is that the details are actually sparse, and they lack what's what you could call legendary quality. They're sparse, and they lack legendary quality. Why is this? You would almost think that the more details, the better, right? You want, you want to pile on those details. You want a, a big, thick testimony. But actually, one of the things that we find as we encounter uh, an account like what we find here at the end of the Gospel of Mark is that the fact that the details are so sparse is a bit of a testimony to the fact that it is an eyewitness account testimony from the time, even if Mark wasn't there, the, the person he's getting it from was an eyewitness of that. And he, you know, an eyewitness won't catch everything that's going on. Right? If you get, if you have like a car accident, for example, right? We get car accidents that happen on the, this corner all the time. And you have a person standing on every corner of that street and a car accident occurs. And then you go and you talk to each of the eyewitnesses of that uh, accident. You're going to get slight variations of what happened because not everybody's going to notice the same stuff. And so one of the things that the, the sparseness of the details tells us is that this is probably a genuine eyewitness account. Uh, and it lacks what, it, what it's called legendary quality. So there are some much, much later false writings that, that try to pass themselves off as something similar to the New Testament. And one of the ways that we know that they're not genuine writings is because of how weird they are. Now, when I say weird, I'm talking about one will account for Jesus coming out of the tomb and his head being so tall that it reaches past the clouds. Like, funky stuff like that. But we don't get anything like that in these accounts because this is a simple eyewitness account of this historical event that happened and it is a reliable and trustworthy and convincing account of the resurrection. So we're going to begin by reading Mark chapter 16 verses 1 through 3. Mark chapter 16 starting in verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. 
And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? All right, a couple of details here. So we have this collection of the very first eyewitnesses, at least of the, of the empty tomb, are a collection of women. Now, we wouldn't think twice about that, all right? That's, that's a person who was there. They saw something, they reported it, end of story. But that's actually not how, at the time, women's eyewitness was treated in like a, a court setting. A woman's testimony was not admissible in court. For the first eyewitnesses on the scene to be a collection of women was actually something that would have been embarrassing to the disciples. Like they're off, the men are off hiding. They're terrified, right? They're, they're locked in rooms. They shut the windows, they're cowering in a corner, right? The women are there to do the, to do the business that needs to be done. But for the first eyewitnesses to be a collection of women would have been an embarrassing reality. This is a detail that they never would have fabricated if they were trying to make up a legend about the resurrection of Jesus. This is not something that you, they would just go, you know what will convince people if we have the most unreliably accepted witness imaginable. So it's something that they would never have made up. They would have never fabricated. It's the, if you've ever kind of had an experience of something that you thought was very strange and you've turned to somebody who was there and you would say, you can't make this stuff up, right? That's this sort of thing. You, you wouldn't make that up. You wouldn't generate or fabricate that kind of detail because at the time that would have normally worked against them. But that's what happened. Second, the burial details. The, the, the kind of thing that was going on with the burial of Jesus describes a short-lived practice that only was going on for a short time in history around the time of Jesus that was not too long thereafter discontinued and it wasn't around for very long. So we know that Jesus is laid in a tomb, right? They don't dig a hole in the ground and stick him in the ground. Why not? Why don't they do that? Well, because there's this other practice that was going on. The practice was a wealthy person practice, right? This is not a tomb purchased by Jesus. This is a tomb that belonged to a wealthy person. And what they would do to honor the, the, the person who, you know, could afford the tomb, was they would take the deceased's body, they would lay it in the tomb, after they would wrap it in pounds and pounds and pounds of linen cloth and all sorts of spices and oils and things to cut down on the odor, they would lay it in the tomb, they would leave it there for about a year to decompose, and then afterward they would come and they would collect the bones and they would put it in a bone box, about yay big, called an ossuary. It's a bone box, is what ossuary means. So what is going on with the, the burial of Jesus is that's what they're intending to do to him, right? When the women are approaching the tomb, it says they're coming to anoint him with oils and spices. That's why they're doing it, because they didn't get a chance to do that when they first laid him in the tomb, because it was such a rush job, right? He dies so close to sundown that they had to get him off the cross, they had to quickly wrap him, get him into the tomb, and they intended to come back later to do the spices and oils to help cut down on the smell of decay when the body would decompose. Well, so the fact that this is a practice that's being described also testifies to the genuineness of the eyewitness account. It's not something that was made up, as some people have assumed, more than 100 years later, because by that time, that practice was long forgotten. That's what the practice had fallen far out of use. So it's one of the things that points to the fact that this is an eyewitness account that just accurately describes the burial of Jesus at the time. So they go on the first day of the week. This is in fulfillment of Jesus' own prediction about his resurrection. They're going to kill me. 
And on the third day, I will be raised from the dead. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On the third day, he was raised from the dead, which is the first day of the week. And there's all sorts of depth and stuff we could go into about the theology of what that means and all of that. But we don't have the we're not we're going to do that this morning. But what is going on here is the fact that Jesus had testified ahead of time numerous occasions that not only was he going to go to Jerusalem, not only was he going to preach in Jerusalem, but that the people who were in charge of Jerusalem were not going to be fans of it, and they would find a way to kill him. He says, they're going to kill me, guys. His disciples heard this. And then it came true. And then he also predicted on the third day, I will be raised again. So Jesus predicted it and it came true. It is in fulfillment of what Jesus predicted about his death and his resurrection. When they get to the tomb, what do they find? Not Jesus. They find an empty tomb. He's not in there. But they will find, of course, something else in there. We'll get to that next. Number two, an essential detail for belief, our belief, is the empty tomb. If Jesus was still in the tomb, that completely invalidates Christianity. That completely invalidates our belief. Right? The Apostle Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, then we are to be pitied above all men. Right? There's no point in following Christ if he had stayed dead. Because that would be just like anybody else who pretended to be a Messiah. There had been other people who claimed to be Messiahs before Jesus and after Jesus. The one thing they all have in common, somebody stopped them, somebody killed them. The one thing they don't have in common with Jesus is Jesus raised from the dead, they did not. Right? His tomb is an empty tomb. It is an empty tomb. Mark chapter 16, verses 4 through 6. Starting in verse 4. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So we have this moment where they finally, they get to the tomb and they were expecting to have trouble because there's this big, heavy stone. And the implication is it's too big for just the three of them to move. They, they, they're on their way and they say, well, wait a minute, what are we going to do about the stone? We can't move that thing. We're going to need help. And as, they, as they're talking about this and they get there, they find that they're not going to need help. It has already been moved. The way in has been made. The way in has... Now, the fact that the stone has been rolled away is not for Jesus' benefit. Uh, when we see Jesus after this point, he does some fascinating things like walk through locked doors. Right? He just appears in rooms that are locked from the inside and, you know, freaks his disciples out, understandably. So the, the stone being rolled away is not for the benefit of Jesus. The stone being rolled away is for the benefit of you and me and his, of course, his early disciples. People like Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary the mother of James and Salome, the ladies who went to the tomb to anoint with spices and things. So the stone is rolled away. It's a very large stone. It's too heavy for just a few women to move. They even mention that before they get there. This is another one of those details that you have to account for if you're going to follow the narrative, if you're going to say this is a historical thing. So when they go into the tomb, they go in because they're like, well, I guess somebody moved it. Maybe, maybe they're like just starting to get a little suspicious of something that's going on. They're like, well, that's weird. 
Did they expect us that we were coming? Did they read the, the, the nicest Roman soldiers I've ever met, apparently, moved the tombstone away from it so that we could go in there and anoint the body of Jesus? No, that's not what happened. They go in and they find not Jesus, but they find somebody else in there. Right? And it just says he's a young man in white robes. So, uh, you are meant to understand this because of the way he gets described and their reaction to him, that this is an angelic figure. This is an angelic creature of some, point, of some kind, right? They go in, they meet this young man, and their response is they're alarmed and terrified. And of course, as with every appearance of angels in the Bible, pretty much, he has to tell them, don't be scared. Well, why does he have to tell them that? Because he's scary. Right? This is the, you have to imagine, it's not just some ho-hum looking guy in white. This is a, an intimidating figure that they encounter when they go into the tomb. He's an angelic figure. Uh, what's fascinating is that there are, uh, I believe it's the, the account in the Gospel of John, there are two angels that are mentioned. Um, the fact that only one is mentioned here is actually not that big of a deal. Mark is really just interested in telling us about one of them and what he says. Uh, the fact that there are two angels Angels mentioned in other ones. This is for free. I actually had not intended to say this, but well, I'm gonna. Uh, so, as you look at the Ark of the Covenant, on the top of the Ark of the Covenant is a part of it called the mercy seat. And what is flanking either side of the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant? You've seen the Indiana Jones. What is it? There's an angelic figures, right? Their wings probably touching all of that. Well, when they go in in, the, in John's account and they see. The, the platform where they had laid Jesus and at one end and at the other end are two angelic figures. That's, this is the mercy seat imagery that we're supposed to think about as we encounter that scene. But anyway, they go in, they see this young man. He has to tell them, look, don't be afraid. Now, at the birth of Jesus, and even running up to the birth of Jesus, we encounter angels. So at the bookends of his birth and his death slash resurrection, we encounter angels, right? So it's the consistency of the themes that we see running through the text of Scripture that tell us this is something that actually happened. It fits the rest of what we know of Jesus' life. It follows that that's what they would find. And then when they go in, they encounter this angelic figure. He tells them, well, there's a reason that you're not finding him here. And the reason is he has risen. It's not left to them to guess what happened. They have to be guided. They have to be told. They have to be instructed as to what actually occurred. Right? So if it was... If it was legendary, if it was something that was simply fabricated, you might expect that these people would be smart enough to figure it out on their own, or they had this moment of flash of inspiration or revelation or whatever, and that they figured it out. No, they're human beings who are dull, just like us, and they have to be told. They have to be told. They don't come out looking so hot. They don't come out looking as brilliant. They don't come out as if they are the wise ones. They come out as ones who are at the receiving end of wisdom, not the giving end of wisdom. So, it is one of those things that they're told he's not here, he is risen, the tomb is empty because Jesus Christ lives. So it's one of those, look, if you haven't figured it out by now, I know he told you he was going to die, I know he told you he was going to rise, but if you're still a little bit slow on the uptake, here's what happened. He is not here, he is risen. He is risen. It's a very simple proclamation. There is no long, flowery speech. There is no long discourse with great depth and theology that we're meant to. It's, it's very simple and very sparse. He's not here. He's risen. 
And that's what we find in the text, in the historical narrative of the resurrection of Jesus. Number three, the details of Christ's resurrection are meant to be shared. The details of Christ's resurrection are meant to be shared. And that fits with the fact of the simplicity of the, of the narrative. It's not a long, complicated, difficult, philosophical discourse. It is a simple proclamation of good news. The gospel, as many have pointed out, is not good advice. It is good news that is meant to be believed, to be accepted, to be received. The details of Christ's resurrection are meant to be shared, and that simplicity helps in the sharing. It's one of those things where if you find yourself with a person who is not a believer, and you feel perhaps compelled to share the good news of Christ with them, don't overthink it. It does not have to be complicated. It does not have to be hard. If somebody asks you, what do you believe? I believe Jesus Christ was God in human flesh. He lived a perfect life completely without sin. He was killed for my sins to be a perfect sacrifice. He was buried and he was raised on the third day. He is not there. He is risen. It's not overly long. It's not overly complicated. It's not philosophical. It is a simple statement of fact, historical fact. Jesus was real. Jesus died. Jesus rose. It's simple. It is not overly hard or complicated. Mark 16, verses 7 through 8. Starting in verse 7. But go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So go tell his disciples. The women were to simply prepare the men to encounter the risen Lord Jesus Christ. That's all. They weren't there to give a long explanation. They were there to go, all right, this is what we saw. We went to the tomb to do the rest of the burial process, and he was gone. And there was an angelic figure there that told us he's not here, he's risen. And you guys get to go find him here, at this place, at this time. That's their call. Go. Go tell. Go share. If, if somebody were to say to you, tell me about Jesus. Why, why should I care about this Jesus? What would you say? How would you express that? Does that give anybody in this room anxiety? Like, oh man, how am I going to do that? It's very simple. Don't overthink it. Tell the truth. Tell it simply. So go tell his disciples. He says to the women, the, the angel says to the women, just go tell them. Just go to them, tell them what happened. That is the call on the life of every believer. Go and tell. Go and tell. He says, you will see him just as he told you. Belief in the resurrection of Christ does not rely on legendary conspiracy, but on eyewitness testimony. We're not making this stuff up. The original writers of the New Testament, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, did not make this stuff up. They reported what was seen. And that's it. That's what we have in the New Testament. It's eyewitness testimony. Um, 
in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. The Apostle Paul is talking to his audience in the city of Corinth, the church in the city of Corinth, and he says, Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and on the third day he was raised according to the Scriptures. And then he says he was seen by the disciples, and then he was seen by 500 brothers at once, some of whom, he says, are still alive. I mean, go talk to them at the time. They're all dead now. But he says, there are eyewitnesses out there. Point to them. They saw him walking around after he'd been killed. They can testify. They had eyewitness testimony that they could go to. And since that time, the New Testament has been codified in the form that we have it now. And this is the eyewitness testimony. It is the eyewitness testimony of, well, this actually, a lot of it comes from Peter. Matthew, he was there. John, he was there. The Apostle Paul saw the risen Christ in Acts chapter 9. And Luke relies on the Apostle Paul. Eyewitness testimony. And so what then happens as we go through the text? They were trembling, they were astonished, and they were afraid as they leave the tomb to go do what the angel tells them. They encounter, uh, this encounter has left them shaken, not confused. Because they do what the angel tells them. They accomplish the mission. If the story were fabricated, you'd expect them to come out looking better. But they come out looking like fallible people who are terrified, who are scared of what they have just encountered. They don't come out brave. They don't come out empowered. Right? It's not until after the disciples spend many, 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 many days with the risen Christ after this point, and they receive the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost, that people then begin to note their boldness. At this point, they're all cowards still. At this point, they're still hiding. They don't look very good. It's not until after, for example, Peter and James and John get arrested in the temple that the temple authorities don't know what to do with them. And the text tells us in the book of Acts, they made note that these men had been with Jesus. Well, they don't look so good yet. It's not until after this point. But all of this is eyewitness testimony, and it looks very convincing to a, a, an astute observer. So what is this gospel? What is this good news? Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, came to be a perfect sacrifice for my sin and yours, because we're all sinners. We're born broken and bent away from God by nature. And he was killed on a cross. He was put in a tomb. And on the third day, he was raised to prove all that he had saw, said and taught. We trust this Jesus. We believe this Jesus. He is not just an interesting historical figure. He is our Savior. And He is our King. Right? It's an election year. Who's going to be in charge? The answer is Jesus. Amen. The answer is Jesus, y'all. Yeah, hallelujah indeed. Because either way, other way, it doesn't look so good sometimes. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. And so, the good news is, we have Jesus. Because He is alive. He is not in the tomb. He is risen. And we can trust this Jesus. We can trust this Jesus. So I recommend you trust this Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for our Lord, our Savior, our King, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross to pay for our sinfulness. 
to exhaust it of its strength to wash us clean and to bring us into your eternal kingdom. We are grateful that Jesus was raised on the third day to prove all that he said was true. We pray now that as we continue our time, as we close our time together today, that our hearts be devoted to Christ. For what a Christ we have, who would not stay dead, who would not remain moldering in some tomb, but who was raised on the third day. We are grateful for this grace, thankful for this peace, and celebrating, celebrating this resurrection. Grace and peace be with all of us, Father. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.